Is that okay? We're good to go. Okay, thank you very much. Ben is uh, visiting family in Virginia. So Heidi is like doing her job, Ben's job, and trying to keep it together. Thanks, Heidi. All right, if you would open up your Bibles to the book of Ezra. Did we get it turned on? Good, thank you. Okay, good, good, good. Chapter 3, verses 8 through 13. And um, we're going to explore this passage, which is a wonderful and perplexing passage uh, from, the, from the book of Ezra. And I've titled my uh, sermon and my thoughts today, Worship As We Are Today. Worship As We Are um, Today. So um, that being said, um, I need my reading glasses. You know it's not going to be smooth, so just get relaxed. while we read this text and then jump into it. Let me give you a little background of what we're going to read. It's a story from the history of the nation of Israel. And it is a story that takes place. You might remember we preached about Israel experiencing such a horrific failure in their government, in their religion and everything, that God, after warning them for centuries, um, took them away into what is called exile. They were taken away by the government and military of Babylon. Their city was destroyed, their temple destroyed, and they lived there for 70 years before they were uh, allowed back into the land of Israel. It's amazing. I don't know if that ever even happens anymore. They were taken, forcibly removed, and then the government changed from the Babylonians to the Persians. And the Persians said, you know, we want people to be back in their own provinces. Not so they can be independent, because they'll be better farmers, better taxpayers, and it's better for everybody. So they were allowed to return in fulfillment of prophecy uh, to Jerusalem. And that's where we're picking up uh, today. And I felt that what we have been through over this last year and a half also has to do with a sense of some suffering, uh, some discomforts, some troubles over these last months that we've been through. And yet we are called back to worship God together today. The suffering continues, and it certainly has been worse in places around our city, our nation, and in the world today. It continues as a horrible crisis. But here we are, able to gather finally again. So that being said, let's read from Ezra and then dive in here. From chapter 3, verse 8. Now in the second year of their coming... To the house of God at Jerusalem in the second month, Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua, the son of Jezodak, and the rest of the brothers, the priests, and the Levites, and all who came from the captivity to Jerusalem, began the work and appointed the Levites from 20 years and older to oversee the work of the house of the Lord. Then Jeshua with his sons and brothers stood united with Kadmiel and his sons, the sons of Judah and the sons of Henadad, with their sons and brothers, the Levites, to oversee the workmen in the temple of God. Now when the builders had laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests stood in their apparel with trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals to praise the Lord according to the directions of King David of Israel. They sang... Praising and giving thanks to the Lord, saying, For he is good, and his loving kindness is upon Israel forever. And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. Yet many of the priests and Levites and the heads of fathers' households The old men who had seen the first temple wept with a loud voice when the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes, while many shouted aloud for joy, so that the people could not distinguish the sound of the shout of joy from the sound of the weeping of the people. For the people shouted with a loud shout, and the sound was heard far away. 
Gracious King, we come before you today reading your word and asking for the amazing gift that your Holy Spirit would actually take these words and take the bumbling words of the preacher and shape them and form them into communication that would perfectly match the need of each soul in this room. And those are all different needs. So we're asking for something that is certainly a miracle. Take this word even now, at this moment, and wake us up, and Holy Spirit, bring it to bear in our lives for your glory, and for our blessing, and for our healing. In Jesus' name, amen. The big question that I want to ask, and that we will answer today is, what are some of the challenges that we face at Grace Church in resuming worship? And if you're anything like me, in March of 2020, I thought we were going to take about three weeks off, and the pandemic was just going to roll on by, and then we were going to be back, you know, worshiping, and, and of course it would have been exactly the way it was three weeks earlier, wouldn't it? And as time went on, I think my planning in, involves saying, well, how are we going to make sure that we make it just like it was before? And, but I didn't stay there for very long because, you know, as I saw the children growing taller and started thinking, good grief, they might even be too big for the little children chairs up front now. And as I started seeing the changes that people went through and the growth and the experiences we had, I started realizing what a horrible act of pride and, and hubris it would be for me to think that I could play time master and roll the clock back to March of 20. 20 and, uh, and make everything the way it was, as if we would ever want that. Um, you wouldn't want me when I was a new pastor in 2003, and uh, I've changed, and you've changed with me. And so we're going to acknowledge that over these next weeks to come. We don't know exactly how we will look. We're not exactly like a church plant. These people that returned to the temple and began putting together temple worship, they weren't a new group, they weren't a new religion, they didn't have a new name or anything like that, but they were starting over. They were starting something new because of a tremendous disruption that had happened to their lives. So we're gonna look at a few of those challenges today. The first thing that we find is a group of fascinating and difficult to pronounce Hebrew and Babylonian names. This is an indicator that's kind of interesting after the Babylonian exile, we find more uh, Babylonian-ish names given to the people who were born in Babylon, or they took new names being in Babylon. You remember the book of Daniel, where Nebuchadnezzar gave new names to these young men that were there? Well, it was common to rename and claim authority over people by changing their name. So we find a lot of interesting names here that are uh, sometimes a little Babylonian in, in their nature. But what's really interesting about it is... Um, they're still the same people. They're still Jews. Now, the first name that we come up with is Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel was a man who was appointed by King, I think Darius, a Persian, appointed to be the governor of what was called the province of Judah. Now, if you remember the days of glory under King David, the kingdom of Judah, which was the kingdom of all Israel, it spread way out on all of the travel roads, far as Damascus, down into Egypt, and up into modern day Turkey, and it had shipping trade. It was a powerful, powerful nation. And Judah itself spread out over a lot of the whole southern part of what is modern day Israel. Here's what the province of Judah was to these people coming back. It was an area that circled the city, the ruins of Jerusalem, for 25 kilometers. That's about, oh, what is 25 times 6? 15 miles. That was the province of Judah. Zerubbabel was a descendant of King David. He was the grandson of King Jehoiachin, who was the last king taken in chains to Babylon. His grandson was appointed a governor. So we had a king, now we have a governor. A king was in charge of a Middle East nation, now we have a governor that's in charge of a, of a province that's smaller than Portland. And that was the province of Judah. Zerubbabel was the governor of that province. But he led the group of Jews back to Jerusalem, 
um, one of the first groups. He is always associated positively in Scripture. He's in the minor prophets in different places. He was quite a guy. He, he, was, he was designed uh, for his position of representing the Persian government in reestablishing the Jews in Jerusalem, not as a king, as a governor. There's actually a prophecy made about his family line. No king will sit on the throne. Well, he wasn't a king. He was a governor. He was answering to a Persian king. But there he was being faithful. We felt that way a lot here too, haven't we? When we've had the government tell us when we can meet, when we can't meet, what we got to do, and who we got to not have, and all of that. And of course, many churches and Christians have chafed against that. It's been difficult. And yet it's not unheard of to actually see God working providentially through kings and Caesar and governments, even, to, even when they don't know they're doing it. So here was the nation of Persia. Darius the Mede uh, reestablished, and, and Cyrus, uh, another king, reestablishing this religion through the governor uh, Zerubbabel. And he was a godly leader with an amazing mission of, of, of uh, restoring the, the Jewish religion in that city. And Zechariah, that's another prophet, one of the smaller uh, length prophecies. Um, Zechariah writes, Then he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Um, what are you, O great mountain? Before, before Zerubbabel, you will become a plain, and he will bring forth the top stone with shouts of grace, grace to it. So Zerubbabel was rebuilding not only the walls of Jerusalem, but the temple. And then we hear in these first verses also of a group of people that are all Levites. All of these names like, oh, what do they have in here? Kadmiel and uh, Jeshua, Jezodak and the rest of their brothers and the priests and uh, um, everybody over 20 and all of that. These are Levites. It's one of the 12 tribes of Israel that left Egypt. And when everybody else of these tribes was getting plots of land, tribe of Judah, tribe of Zebulun, Manasseh, Ephraim, Benjamin, the Levites were told, you will receive no land for the Lord your God is your inheritance. You will have the privilege of serving as priests to the nation of Israel. So serving as priests meant not only that they were preaching, prophesying, but they were leading music, they were caring for the temple grounds. A, a Levite would be that person sweeping and cleaning up the floors. A Levite would be in charge maybe of the finances of the temple grounds. Everybody that had to do with the temple business was to be the tribe of the Levites. They came together in unity when they returned to Jerusalem and said, you know what, we gotta stop arguing. We gotta, we gotta get along. We're rebuilding something. Something big has happened. We have an amazing opportunities. We are all Levites by our tribal associations. And so all of the leaders of the Levites, young and old, they got together and they all got along to begin the religion of Judaism again. They began having sacrifices. They put together an altar. Um, the walls of the city, I don't believe they've been built or, or solidified yet. But, they, uh, but, but the, the, the sacrifices went on, the religion, and then they came time to, to, to say, we want to build a temple. And they laid the foundation of the temple, and that's what this is. It doesn't mean it's the cornerstone. You know, that's a lot of analogy of Christ there, and it's beautiful. But it means not laying down the stones that would become the temple. Now, when you see the foundation of a building, you know what that building's going to look like, don't you? You drive by a house now and you see the forms out there and they're going to pour that foundation. You know exactly the shape that that house is going to be. It's right there in the foundation. It can only go so far outside the foundation. And you, you, you know if it's going to be a huge, great, big house with all the levels and all of that. Or if it's going to be a smaller little place that's just a, a square, you know, that's, that's, that's made there. They looked at the foundations of this temple and they saw that it was not much. It was nothing like the Temple of Solomon that took years and years to build. Uh, amazing place is what this temple, temple was. And they, uh, they saw that and they, and, and they knew that and it affected them. Well, these were the Levites and they were putting together the worship again. And it says that the foundation laying celebration was marked by joy and grief. 
The people rejoiced loudly when they saw this foundation being laid. These were the younger people that were born in Babylon, and they were Levites. And they had kept their priestly clothing in the family. Back in this day, you didn't just go to Target or Walmart or go on Amazon to buy new clothes. You had beautiful quality clothing that lasted for generations. And they, I believe, had retained and kept their priestly clothing as Levites that had been laid out for them in the scriptures that they were to wear. They had kept their instruments. You remember Psalm 137, by the rivers of Babylon, there we, we wept and that uh, we hung our harps on the willows of Babylon while they demanded of us songs, but we couldn't play songs in a foreign land. That's a musician who had brought his instrument to Babylon and hung it on, on one of the trees. I don't think he left it there. But the family of these Levites, particularly the tribe of Asaph, had, were, they had their clothing, they had their instruments, and they began to lead this celebration uh, for the laying of the foundation. Asaph was a special tribe within the Levites that uh, King David and Asaph were besties. They were both psalm writers, musicians with a real feel for putting together public worship. So David wrote down as directions the way that temple would be built and the way worship would happen. And Asaph and his family were the house musicians. They were like Israel's Heidi and Ben's. They, they were the house musicians, and they prophesied. They were involved in all of the leadership decisions, and they led the public worship of Israel, performing the music, singing the words as it had been laid out by David. So this group came to start back on public worship, and they had the tribe of Asaph there, the Levites, uh, the, the descendants of Aaron the priest. And, and all of these people, they were all there to start making the, 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 the worship of Israel again, according to David. And it says that they, they sang, they gave thanks, and their message was uh, basically summarized by saying, God is good because his loving kindness is on us forever. Wow. Think about what they were looking at. They were in the neighborhood where their grandparents had been killed. They were in the neighborhood where tragedy had occurred, still surrounded by rubble. They were not an international, strong, powerful community. They were not visited by lots of tourists. They didn't have much money at all. They struggled to even get the job done. And now they're looking at a foundation of a temple that looks probably something like uh, what would have been a little shed. Uh, it's bigger than that, but compared to Solomon's temple. And their message was, we will praise God because he's good and because his loving kindness, his mercy on Israel lasts forever. And so when that happened and the people you know, said those words, everybody yelled. It was like, it was like, yeah, it was, whoa. And, and think about that. Now, to the old-timers who had seen the Temple of Solomon, they were just struck, and they were weeping. Oh, these kids here, they're, they're rejoicing over, over what's, what's a shed. If only they knew the way this thing used to look. You see, when you conquered a land in the ancient world of all these ancient civilizations, you didn't go right to the palace, and you didn't go to the business district, and you didn't go, you didn't do anything like that. You went right to the temple. That's where they kept their gold, their money. It's, it's where all of the wealth was. And you would destroy the temple so that psychologically, those people would be very clear that their God was no match for your God. And that comes out in the book of Daniel. The gods of, the, of Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians were greater than the God of Israel. And, and, and so the old men looking at that, and they're old Levites, by the way. They were old priests that has seen that temple there weeping so loudly that it makes a kind of a din. You can't tell if it's happy. You can't tell if it's sad. You don't, it's indistinguishable, the word says. You don't know what they were saying because it's just this loud uh, roar, indistinguishable, and from far away it just sounded like, I don't know, if you're a half a mile away from a, from a Timbers game or something, you, you can't really tell a lot of what's being said or 
chanted, you just know people are making a lot of noise. Those old timers, the old, the old Levites that were there, uh, historically they have gotten a really, they've been treated pretty badly. <laughs> I mean, I've heard sermons and sermons and sermons about, you know, you've got to be ready to bring in the new and here, look at these people weeping and discouraging the young kids and, and uh, uh, they just didn't realize uh, all the good things God was doing and, and um, I think they get a bad, bad riff there. I, I don't think they're treated quite right. What they remembered was the siege of Jerusalem where women... Uh, had been driven to cannibalism of their own children. Where women and children died on the streets of Jerusalem for starvation. Where uh, murder inside the city was as bad, if not worse, as the violence outside the walls of the city as they were surrounded by the army of Babylon. Their king tried to escape and got caught. Just... One of the most disastrous sieges of ancient history, perhaps rivaled only by the Roman siege of Jerusalem in 70 AD, which kind of followed the same pattern. No food, uh, water that was running out, supplies running out, and, and, and finally an invasion and the destruction and then the pillaging of the temple with all of its gold, all of its utensils, all of that fancy fine stuff that Moses had written on how they're to build it, all of it taken away to Babylon, stored in the back room somewhere in, in, a, in its own temple, and then displayed as trophies of victory of the Babylonian gods. And as the old timers looked at that, their thought was, I believe, this was my fault. I don't believe they were thinking, oh, the temple was so beautiful. What a shame the kids can't see it. I believe they were struck, those of them with any insight at all, with the fact that it was their fault. They led the nation in hypocrisy. They led the nation away from God. They threw the prophets in jails and killed them. They developed a wealthy religious system that became basically just a big bank account for the nations around them to take. They allowed idolatry, the worship of other gods in the city of Jerusalem, at times even in, in the temple itself. Personally, they were public servants of Yahweh, of the Lord, and privately, as the prophet Ezekiel was shown, they worshipped the other gods too and bowed down to them. Those that repented, those that lived, those that made it back uh, after all of that, I believe they were weeping to realize that the religion they were restarting and trying to get going was sad because it just didn't have to be that way. They'd been warned for centuries of what would happen by leaving their loyalty to God. Children died. Men and women died, young men, armies, people lost their savings, they lost their farms, they lost their life, and it was all their fault. And they watched that and they wept. They brought their grief to worship. I want to wrap this up by telling you just a, a couple of things here that I see that are issues we will deal with as we worship, and some challenges that we will continue to face at Grace Church, just like them. The first thing is the challenge of change. The challenge of change. Um, while many things in the world around us have changed, that's why you're all wearing masks. I'm not, by your permission. I, I, you know, give, a couple of months ago, I wouldn't be either. I would have a, something else on because change. And it's change that doesn't just happen in the world around us. It is change that happens in our church. We have people that have changed and been changed. So we have to deal with that, and it's going to affect the way we worship here at Grace Church. Here's the deal. I don't know how it will affect us, okay? Pastors love to lay out like three-month plans and six-month plans. I talked with a, a friend of mine in Beaverton who pastors a church out there, Avery Stafford. Just a great pastor. And he said, no. I said, how are you doing today? We were having lunch. He said, oh, the secretary wants my six-month preaching 
my six-month preaching plan. And I, I don't know. I'm just not wired that way. And, you know, we usually do are wired that way. We like it, but that's changed. So I'm not going to be preaching through the book of Acts until we stabilize a little bit more. And then we will go and pick up Paul in Berea and finish the, uh, finish the journey with him. But I'm going to preach it week by week according to what it seems to me God is doing as best I can see and what we would like to, what, what we need to go through. And you can talk to me if you have any ideas. Uh, I'm certainly happy to hear that. But it's going to be week to week. That's different. But we're going to trust. That's the change. But in the midst of that tr change, guess what? It's still this. Man, you have seen one change after another over this past year. Even St. Anthony Fauci, who I really like, has made some changes, hasn't he? The CDC, it's made some changes. Every week we get a new ruling or a new study because there's zillions of studies going on, and rightly so. We keep up with the changes, but you know what? What we do in worship will still be this. For them, it was the writings of King David and Asaph who wrote 12 of the Psalms. They stuck with that as their foundation. That's what we're going to do. We'll also unite for the purpose of, of, of worshiping um, in the midst of a changing culture. Okay? Um, it's going to be a little strange. But our mission remains the same. To speak so highly and so well of Jesus. And of the opportunity to know Him and be forgiven and be loved. That we still want to figure out a way to be clear to the, to the world around us. So the point is, we're still going to meet as worshipers of Jesus Christ. We're not meeting as survivors of a pandemic. This is not exactly post-apocalyptic, you know, uh, soil and green time or anything, anything like that. I'm glad most of you don't know that movie. Um, this is not that. This is meeting to worship Jesus Christ in a challenging time. And we will also follow our leaders um, as they follow and serve the Lord Jesus. Notice these people were following the leadership of the Levites, but they were following the leadership of the Levites who were servants and doing it right. You don't follow somebody because he's called a pastor or whatever he chooses, he or she chooses to call himself. You follow those who you believe are humble servants under the authority of Jesus Christ for his church. And, and we will continue to look for those leaders and, and follow them. Okay, we'll do, our, we'll do our best, and I, I appreciate it, and I'm quite humbled that you actually follow my leadership, and I appreciate that. Thank you, and the council does too. So that's some of the changes, and then some of the stable things that we're looking at too. The second thing I think that I see in our worship is joy. Um, if we care to look around us, we will find reasons, not just to eke out a feeling of joy, no, you will find reasons to say, praise God. And in the midst of everything going on, look at this. These people who were looking at the temple and shouting for joy when they saw the foundation, they were slaves in Babylon. They didn't have a temple in Babylon. In fact, it's in Babylon that the synagogue system of Jewish, Jewish, uh, Jewish, Jewish, Jewish worship began where you would meet with a small group. That, that started in Babylon because they didn't have anywhere else to go. They didn't have any yearly festivals. They didn't slaughter their sacrificial animals. They lost it all. And suddenly they are in Jerusalem, which they'd only heard about from their parents and grandparents. And they're standing in Jerusalem and they actually have their own altar to offer sacrifices the way they had been directed to offer sacrifices. And now, as if that weren't enough, they're laying a foundation. They're going to have their own temple. Wow! Now, a temple in these ancient civilizations is not a place where people meet to worship. The inside of the temple, I don't even know if it was as big as this room. It was a place where God dwelt with his people. So they looked at that and said, wow, we're actually back in God's land. We're actually back in a place that's going to be a place where God will dwell. This is amazing. And they, they yelled with joy about it. Wow. So in our worship, we will make the choice they made. We will show up to worship. Just showing up. You get like major points. Just showing up is a big deal. Especially in downtown Portland, am I right about that? 
one-way traffic, when do I pay for parking, what's going to happen, I mean, just show up. We will show up to worship, and we will make a choice in our worship to praise God, and to remember His goodness, and to state it, and to uh, remember that His faithfulness has made it even possible for us to be here today. So we'll do that with joy. Now the other part of this that I see is involves the word grief. Yes, we will show up. We'll continue to keep the important foundational parts of our faith and worship. And yes, we will choose joy. And we will remain open to it, but also we will acknowledge grief. We will bring the grief of loss, of failure, of pain, of regret. We'll bring it to worship with us. We won't leave it at home and then put on our church face to come in here and, and worship together. Everything is so good. I, I mean, I've got a new job, got new babies, got the parking spots I wanted this week, and it's three for one day at Fred Meyer. I mean, this is sweet. No, no. We will show up with genuine joy at what God has done, but we'll show up with honesty about our failures and our losses and our struggles. Some of us have lost people to death during the COVID time. Some of us remain distanced and far from people that we dearly, dearly love. And we have not, people in our family, children and parents and grandparents, we've not been able to see them. Ben is seeing his mom and dad for the first time since it all started. Um, so there's some grief in there. And we won't wait to feel good before we bring it into the house of God to worship. And I also want to say something about that indistinguishable sound. Um, that's also gotten a lot of talk and preaching and whatnot. When a church becomes poisoned by the naysayers and the grievers, their message to the world around us becomes indistinguishable and the gospel doesn't go out there. No, that's not true. When people are authentic and real with who they are and what they are living before God, their gospel becomes real and their faith becomes distinguishable. And there are certainly times when the, when the grief mixes with the joy and the joy mixes with the grief. And you know what? Maybe it doesn't make a lot of sense to others, but it is a time where we are healing and worshiping as we are. So that being said, uh, again, I want you to worship with me, acknowledge the joys and, and the griefs that we've had, and keep gathering to worship, opening up the Bible to what it says and how it affects us, um, and expecting change in many things, but knowing that there are the deeper things that won't change here at Grace Church. Please pray with me. Gracious King, we bring you our lives today. We thank you for blessing us with your word. Bring together all these words in this text that we've read and all of that. Would you please put the conclusion and the application there? Would you please make it make sense to us so that it pulls us not through, not just out of, but it makes us in a time of pandemic your worshiping people. Draw us closer, bless us, build us up, care for us, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.